We're at the end of Adventure Month here on the Retro Hour podcast, where all throughout the last month we've been celebrating this amazing new book, The Art of Point and Click Adventure Games, from our good friends at Bitmap Books. Now, we're going to have another brilliant contributor to the book joining us on this week's show. But if you'd like to get a look at it and buy a copy of the book, you'll be really helping out the podcast. You can find it right now at theretrohour.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 144, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And we're being very healthy this week. I see we've got uh, no coffees, no caffeine, we're on the water tonight. Isn't that because the kettle's broke? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's because next week... We're going to completely throw our diets out the window because it's back to Blackpool. Oh, yes, <laughs> totally. Cheap booze, cheap chips. Cheesy uh, chips, kebabs, all oh, of that. I can't yeah. wait. Um, Blackpool's excellent. Yeah. Like, we're going to be doing the talks there and I oh, just absolutely love this place. You know, there's a big YouTuber panel we're going to be doing. There's also Dreamcast Junkyard. They're doing the uh, 20th anniversary of the Dreamcast and they've got... Adam Krillick from America. Yeah, flying over. Well, this is for Play Expo, isn't it? Play Expo Blackpool. It's going to be happening next weekend at the Nork Olympia Exhibition Centre, or Norbrecht Castle, uh, 27th to the 28th of October. I was just thinking, it doesn't feel that long ago since we were last at Play Blackpool. That's because it wasn't actually. It was the start of the year, wasn't it? Yeah, so (laughs) this one's kind of in place of uh, Play Manchester, which had to change venue, but it will be back next year. And, uh, you know, this is a a cool little winter bash and we've got some really cool things coming up. They're going to be a talk with tax set as well. And, of course, the legendary Jeff Minter. Now, Jeff, we've met lots of times at shows and every time we see him, we're like, oh, Jeff, come on the podcast. He's like, yeah, yeah, come on, lads. We never get around to sorting it out. So we're going to have to drag him to Blackpool and sit him down on a panel and interview him. (laughs) Yeah, Jeff's made some amazingly unique games over the time. Well, last time we saw him, he had the um, Polybius VR game, didn't he? He was showing at play Manchester. And then um, we had a little go of Tempest 3000 on the new one with these little weird homemade rotary controllers. Yeah, and then he'd released, uh, I think, 4000 for Steam. Yep. Yeah, so uh, Jeff's been very busy recently, hasn't he? All the tales of Llama Soft, so that's going to be a good one. And, of course, all the talks that we do at Play Expo Blackpool, we'll be putting them up on YouTube and putting a few out on the show as well. Jeff Minter will absolutely be broadcast on the following week as well. And all the usual stuff you get at Play Expo, I mean, it is the UK's biggest retro gaming event, and that means arcades, pinball machines. Our cosplay, there's... Yep. there's- also merchandise, and I really don't want to spend money, but I know I'm going to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, Ravi's like, you know, Joe and me and Alex, we all get money out of the cash point. Ravi's like, oh, I'm not going to spend anything. I won't bother. Then you're running around. <laughs> like, like, guys, have you got eight quid? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know where a cash point is? <laughs> um, and there's going to be loads of rare systems there this year as well, I've heard. A few little surprises that you may not have seen in the UK before. And, of course, we did say before that it is a bit of a Dreamcast anniversary special as well. Um, Adam Korolik, who is, we've had him on the podcast before, probably the best Dreamcast YouTuber and the most well-known one. Um, he's going to be flying over from America to do a couple of panels with us. There'll be a load of exclusive Dreamcast stuff that you may not have seen before there as well. Well, it's mad because the Dreamcast scene's still getting busier. He does yeah. a series on his YouTube, uh, Keep Dreaming, and yeah. he's just covered on Escape. Uh, no, the Escapee, which came out for the Amiga before, and that's just been converted to the Dreamcast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a great company called Josh Prod, and they're kind of officially porting all of these things so it's fantastic to see and we'll hear loads of new Dreamcast stuff I'm sure about Absolutely. Shenmue as well yeah so it should be a good one if you're around next weekend we will see you there for Play Expo Blackpool if you need to buy tickets for that you can get a link on our website at theretrohour.com and I can't believe that we've reached the end of Adventure Month I've had so much fun this month it's been awesome you know we tried this for the first time yeah. uh, just theming a month because usually our show's not theme for every month and uh, I've had people going so what's the theme next month yeah. and I'm like oh, <laughs> we're not that prepared but we're really happy that it's gone down so well everybody seems to be really liking it and I particularly enjoyed Dan's uh, live stream now I sat down on Sunday night to play probably my all time favourite point and click adventure game The Secret of Monkey Island and I originally intended to sit down for an hour or yep. so how long were you there about for? two and a half hours <laughs> yeah. I think in the end you were the same though the week before, weren't you, when you were playing like uh, Sam and the Sorcerer? You just, about two and yeah, a you just get two <laughs> into the game. Yeah. I didn't want to stop, but then I could smell dinner cooking in the next room yeah. at about quarter past nine. So I may do a little um, part two of that this weekend um, on Sunday night. So I'll put a link on our Facebook and Twitter. You can keep an eye on all that on our YouTube as well if you want to watch me. Might even do Secret Monkey on 2 maybe this weekend. Awesome. A bit of that, that'd be fun. Now we have reached the end of Adventure Month. We've got to say a big thank you to Sam and the team at Bitmap Books. And this amazing 
amazing new book, The Art of Point and Click Adventure Games, who have made Adventure Month possible. Now, we've been talking about it over the last couple of weeks. It's essentially a massive book. Listen. It's huge. Break at the desk. And it's got so many different titles in. And I'd say the main thing about me reading this book is it's reminded me of other titles yeah. as well that I'd totally forgotten about. And it kind of puts you back into that place where you were playing point and clicks as a little kid. Well, not only does it show you some of the great artwork that was in these games. I mean, listen to the interviews we've done over the last few weeks. A lot of these games had, you know, not computer artists. They had proper painted artwork in yeah. there as well. And it covers games that we've been playing, stuff like The Secret of Monkey Island, Maniac Mansion, Simon the Sorcerer, uh, Gabriel Knight, King's Quest, Mist, Discworld, all of that in this book as well. If you want to get hold of a copy of it, you can buy it on our website right now and support the podcast. You'll be really helping us out. Or we've been giving you a chance to win a copy every week as well. And we'll be sending all of these out in the next couple of weeks. Well done to this week's winner, David Finnamore. A copy of the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games book will be on its way to you over the next couple of weeks. And you can find out more and get a look at the book at theretrohour.com. Now, to round off Adventure Month, we're going to bring you someone else who is a contributor to the book. And that is the legend that is Hal Barwood. Now, Hal, he's done a series of games that we've not really covered before, which is a travesty. Because yeah. These are absolutely <laughs> amazing games. And they're... Indiana Jones series, yeah. if you remember those from LucasArts and like The Fate of Atlantis, they were great point of clicks, but also he worked on Rebel Assault too, which was epic. So we're going to get some stories about his time at LucasArts. And I mean, not only did he work in video games, but before that, he had a long career in movies as well. He even had a part in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, yeah, wow. We'll find out more about. Amazing film, that is. And he's worked a lot with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, so definitely hang around for this one. It's going to be a great one to round off Adventure Month. Hal Barwood is going to be our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, we do just have to say a big thank you to the people who allow us to keep doing the Retro Hour podcast week in, week out. There are many ways you can support the show. You know, you could buy the book from our website. You could give us a little five-star rating on your favourite podcast client. Yeah, you could share us and get someone new listening to the podcast. Yeah, that always helps. Or you can even help us out financially as well because, you know, running a weekly podcast does have its expenses, we must admit. We don't mind paying for it, but any help we get is really appreciated. And for making a donation, you will find your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Just like this week, James Alston. Michael Garrett. Gary Heather. And Raymond DeVert. Who all made donations into the running of the show, and you can do the same at theretrohour.com. Okay, more mini console news. Oh, gosh, what is, what is it this time? Well... It's one that we talked about. Some people thought this would never happen. We were like, it's got to happen, surely. The Nintendo 64 Mini. Yeah, so there's been these photos leaked online about the N64 Mini. We saw previously that Nintendo had registered patents on the controllers. Yeah. Um, I've been looking on Nintendo Life, which is a site that I trust quite a lot. And they're saying it seems to be very... Uh, badly done kind of fake you know okay. it's, it's it's got items in it that nintendo would not allow uh you know this low quality of a product well so. these appeared on reddit so essentially what they are is it's three pictures yeah that are very closely zoomed in don't show a lot of detail but they claim it is the n64 mini and this has been shared on twitter and a lot of people are going where did you get these pictures from mm. and the only reply is a source a source. So if you look at it, I mean, just to kind of explain, it's a bottom of what looks like an N64, but it's got support.nintendo.com on there, as in like, you know. Which is the same copy of the um, uh, Nintendo that they had as well. The, okay. uh, uh, they had support Nintendo.com and Made in China on the bottom of the previously released mini ones. So you know on the front of the N64 you had those four custom controller ports? Yeah, yeah. They look like they're on there, but they're actually on a weird tab of plastic that you slide out. They're kind of like fake ports, and then behind there, there looks to be some like kind of custom... They don't look like standard USB ports on here. But it looks like, essentially, the real ports are hidden behind this fake plastic cover. Yeah, that sounds like someone just kind of snapped the end off that plastic yeah. ring. That but, looks really flimsy. But Nintendo Life uh, are proper nerds on this. Yeah. So they, they looked into it and they said there's certain stuff like the kerning, which is the gaps between the words. The fonts. The yeah. fonts, yeah. yeah, between each letter looks off. And uh, there's stuff like the Nintendo 64 logo is white on this. Now, if you remember on the original, the Nintendo wording was grey and the 64 was white, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, they're just saying, you know, 
Nintendo wouldn't let this kind of uh, bad quality go through. And if you look closely on the kind of reset button and stuff, it doesn't look quite right to me. You know? Yeah, we were looking before we started recording and looking very closely zoomed in, there is a close-up of the memory expansion port on the, on the top of it, which you wouldn't think would be there on a mini console anywhere. Why, why would the memory expansion port Yeah, be there? maybe it's just a plastic thing that they've, uh, you know... But then the Printed. the text on it does look like it's photoshopped on. It doesn't yeah. look real. And the reset button as well, which is a bit weird because you think, why wouldn't they just take a photo of a, an and, extra and, one? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's very odd. And uh, I think that obviously the N64 Mini is happening, but yeah. I don't think these are the photos. I could be wrong and so could Nintendo Life, but you never know. Well, there's no word from Nintendo yet. So again, I think it will happen, but I kind of feel like it's probably too late in the year now for it to happen this year. Yeah, aiming for Christmas, it's going to be the PlayStation Mini, isn't it? Yeah. That's going to be the big hitter. So I think we'll probably will get one, but I'd expect it probably next summer. And I think what you said there is right as well. Their attention to detail is normally really good. Yeah. And I can't imagine them putting out, like, you know, a version of one of their consoles with the the logo with the wrong colours on and stuff like that. It's not going to happen, is it? Someone at home in Photoshop could yeah. <laughs> easily. <laughs> what, yeah. the turn out to be real now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Egg on our face. Yeah. Let's talk about something else that's had a bit of a comeback this week. This should bring back some memories. Winner. Winner. It really whips the llama's ass. <laughs> yeah, I've been seeing this. The poor this. llama is getting whipped again. <laughs> <laughs> I've been seeing this everywhere. And Winamp, uh, yeah, it's one of the best music players in the world. I, I still think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, Winamp Classic, that is, because I was a huge Winamp user back in the day. Yeah. Love the port of it, Amiga Amp for the Amiga. It was probably the most copied like skin or user interface in the oh, world, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's so many like, different rip-offs. So right, many yeah. rips of Winamp. But what happened was Winamp um, started this great service, which was a, a Shoutcast and uh, Icecast, which was your early internet radio stations. Even 56K would yeah. be streaming on that. And in the late 90s, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and we'd have video channels on there, so you could watch all the Simpsons and stuff uh, in really low format constantly. But it worked, and it was really good. And then AOL... Um, bought them and suddenly it was just a barrage of advertising (laughs) any of the versions uh, the new versions I'd install strip out all the advertising put it back to the classic skin but it would still never feel the same as the classic version and I really got my heart ruined by Winamp (laughs) and I've moved on (laughs) well AOL a lot of people said they only bought it like to kind of put it on those free AOL CDs that they gave yeah, out to promote their services. Because it was like, what was it? AOL, Real Player, hmm. uh, Winamp, and they were all just pushing the same kind of stuff. See, Real Player, I remember when that first came around, probably about maybe 98, I probably started using it about 20 years ago, probably. And then, I mean, most media that you got on the internet was Real Audio, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Real Audio or video the size of a postage stamp yeah. <laughs> that you'd get. <laughs> That's all your computer could probably handle back yeah. then, though. And then Real, they brought Real Jukebox out. Do you remember that? And yeah. that was a bloated mess. Even back at, you know, when, when Real Audio was at its peak, I always hated it. And then MPEG came along and MP3s and everything. And Winamp was my player of choice. But, I mean, I actually still have Winamp on my Windows 10 PC. But I've got the version from, like, 2001. That's the thing, like, if you want to play stuff like FLAC and other formats, you have to get loads of really dodgy plugins and kind of... Uh, there's, like, a user, user build of Winamp that's still kind of going. So you can update it but it, it it's quite hard you know it's just not a distro like vlc that you can download bam play any format in the world well F- fubar 2000 become my like player of choice over the last few years which is very good uh, but there is something about winamp that not only evokes a lot of nostalgia but i think the simplicity of winamp at its core having that nice playlist editor even the eqs you know the fact you instantly change the equalizer on the go as well just when it was at its best None of that stuff all in your face. It was just a very straightforward music player. Oh, yeah. It was like um, kind of uh, <laughs> the guys would have a list of uh, Winamp MP3s that they downloaded back in the days, and it'd be like, look at my list, see how big it yeah, is. Yeah. And you'd be scrolling <laughs> for 10 minutes, yeah. and it was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you ever the biggest playlist was the coolest kid on the block. Exactly, yeah. Well, as it turns out, there is a company called uh, Radionomy, who now, it seems, own the trademarks to Winamp, and they're saying they're going to bring it back. So apparently, at the time of recording this, there should be a new version of it, kind of just a slight enhanced version of what's out now that should be out this week. But the proper version, Winamp version 9, is going to be released in 2019. And they're saying they're bringing it for mobiles as well. Yes, it's going to be a new desktop client, uh, new mobile version of it too. 
And the saying that they're kind of going to enhance what remained of it before, but you can listen to not only your MP3s that you might have on your hard disk, but also to the cloud, to podcasts, and to streaming radio stations. But the, the original Winamp could do that anyway, couldn't it? Yeah, it could. And the thing is, it's like the world's moved on, guys. Mm. Like iTunes did that whole searchable system, the whole podcasts and the whole kind of sorting thing. And I use Music B which is a kind of free alternate version for Windows, but it's very like that. So it, I don't know, imagine how old it would feel if you had just that old big Winamp interface on your iPhone. I don't know. I, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. But then I do, I hate iTunes on the desktop. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. It, that, that is the opposite of Winamp. That is overkill. iTunes for Windows, yeah. It's, Even on Mac. I hate it on Mac. You really? Huh? Yeah, it's just too much in there and I can never find anything. Every new version, they move stuff around. And so I just want to get the store. I want to find a, a, a file on my system. And it's like, it's just too much. Yeah. And you, sometimes you just want a simple music player. I mean, if you, do, you could use Spotify and stuff like that, which a lot of people do these That's days. That's it. I, I also suppose people's music collections are streaming now yeah. rather than local, which I'd, they used to be back then. So. I think that's a challenge that maybe a lot of normies actually don't have massive 100 gigabyte collections of music i actually do so for me it's actually quite a good thing having a simple music player but they reckon there are still about 100 million users regularly every month of winamp around the world oh wow so it's still got a pretty decent following apparently and they reckon this will be able to plug into stuff like your spotify playlist or your google music library for example and that is one thing that would be quite nice having a good front end for google music yeah because at the moment using it on their web interface is awful trying to find stuff so it's cool to see it back anyway um I'm not going to say it's going to be great or write it off until I get to try a new version of it. But. They, they ruled the world and I got too burned with it. That's my... That's You're still my sore, I'm still sore, yeah. <laughs> I've still not... got Winamp wounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that llama's going to get whipped again, it seems, yeah. so we'll, uh, we'll put more about that in our show notes. That poor as llama. <laughs> <laughs> what did the llama do wrong, anyway? Yeah. I never did find out. So we'll put that in the rest of this week's stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com, along with the Analog Mega SG. Now, apparently, this is the ultimate Sega Mega Drive. Yeah, so um, you, you've heard of the Analog NT. We've which, talked about it before, haven't we? Yeah, it was the absolute beautiful recreation of um, the SNES. Yeah. And uh, it's basically an FPGA, but it's built from the ground up, reverse engineered the whole thing, and they've basically built it so it's 99% compatible with games and they've done a Nintendo system and released it and not got sued which is probably why I guess they did the uh, Nintendo system first just to test the waters maybe yeah if Nintendo don't sue them Sega will probably be alright yeah. yeah. so now they've decided to do a Mega Drive version and this thing looks gorgeous yeah so the company's called Analog and uh, it's it's uh, not an exact chip that was used in a Genesis it's, it's a copy of a, a different kind of chip that was in there but it will still speak to the game cartridge and connect to the motherboard and it'll be exactly like a genesis but it will also have the yamaha sound chip right on board as well so the, the ym2612 yeah so sonic 3 is gonna sound awesome like that well that's the thing so a lot of these especially the at game stuff the worst thing normally about clone mega drives is it sounds awful on them isn't it it is yeah and another thing is that a lot of them don't support external things. Yeah. So here they're saying, you know, uh, they they support lots of different, all the adapters and the plugins that will be going in there as well. So you might be able to get some uh, 32X well, stuff running through there. I was looking into that. I don't think you can because its main output is HDMI. And if you remember, a lot of people have been saying, oh, surely 32X would work. With the 32X, you had to run the Mega Drive's RGB ah. into the 32X and out, didn't you? So... That's not going to work. Um, but, I mean, everything else should work on it. They reckon it's going to be, yeah, pretty much like you said, 99% compatible. Because it is, it's FPGA, which is essentially a recreation, you know, a kind of a software level on a chip, I guess, Yeah. of the original hardware. Um, it's not running an emulator on, like, an ARM chip or something like that. And it's $189, which is a really good price. Yeah. And, uh, you know... I think Sega should hook up with these guys. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, we know that Mega Drive Mini is meant to be coming out next year. I mean, this thing just looks really cool as well. I know there are, there's a lot to be said. I mean, I'm looking at a few of the comments here on Engadget, and people are like, oh, you just emulate it on your PC. It's not the same as having a nice bit of kit in front of your TV that can do it all in, in a modern form factor. Um, HDMI out, even the controller that's on there as well looks really nice. And, and I guess you can't have those add-ons as well. You know, yeah. with, with your PC, you can't have all the crazy Frankenstein uh, 
Frankenstein's monster well, I did read, stuff. I did read some stuff that the Mega CD apparently will work on this. So mm. apparently it's got the expansion slot, like the original Mega Drive had. So, you know, if you do want to play Sonic CD and stuff like that, it should work fine, which is very cool. You don't normally get that with recreation systems. No, no, so. this this one is like 99% accurate. It's, yeah. it's a piece of art. So, yeah, it looks really cool. So, again, we'll put that in the show notes if you want to find out more and get yours ordered. Now, before we get into our interview with Hal Barwood, there was some very sad news this week that a true pioneer in the personal computer industry passed away, and that was Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. Yeah, so uh, it was pretty much Paul, Bill and Barmer, yeah. wasn't it, together? And uh, Paul Allen is a really nice guy. He... Uh, he actually um, managed to convince Bill Gates to drop out of Harvard University wow. <laughs> to pursue Microsoft and then did uh, deal with the operating system, uh, which became MS-DOS. Yeah. What do you think, I mean, you know, you talk about like the butterfly effect, that kind of thing, and like sliding doors, movies like that, what would happen if this conversation didn't happen there and how different would life be? Just imagine if he hadn't convinced Bill to drop out of Harvard, though Microsoft never existed. Yeah. You've got to think. How much would that have impacted? And drop out of Harvard. How hardcore of a thing is that? Yeah, that's got to be. I mean, to persuade someone to do that, that is a pretty persuasive guy, isn't it? To actually believe in someone enough to say, look, do this. It's the right thing to do. And one thing as well about Paul is he's... He's not only probably the nicest guy of the original Microsoft team. I never really hear any bad stories about him. You know, I hear how Bill used to be ruthless in the 90s. Yeah. And there was a time when pretty you much... You can imagine Barmer just losing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, Paul always came across like a gentleman in yeah. anything I've seen about him. And he also respects the history of the industry as well, doesn't he? Totally, yeah. So he helped set up um, the Living Computer Museum, yeah, which is in Seattle. And... It's amazing because it's got like the PDP ones and all of the really old mainframe machines, the Cray 2s, and like he's still got them working in America, which is just fantastic. And to see that he helped found this museum, and you know, people can go there now and uh, kind of celebrate it. Yeah. I mean, even talking about the, the genre that we cover, obviously, you had your MS DOS and your Windows and all that, but going back to the 8 bit days as well, I mean, how many 8 bit computers have Microsoft Basic on them? Yeah, yeah all well, well, even the Amiga did. Yeah. You know, that was, everything had Basic Commodore 64, and, yeah. yeah, everything, wasn't it, at Microsoft Basic on back then. So their kind of influence in the development of personal computing, it can't be understated at all. So, I mean, to, to be someone like Paul, who essentially without him, the industry would not be what it is today. Yeah. So really interesting, guys. Well, if you want to learn more about him, we'll put a couple of links in this week's show notes too. Right then, well, we will see you next week for the big one, Play Expo in Blackpool. We're going to be there Saturday and Sunday. You'll be there, Ravi. I'm going to be there on Sunday because I'm at a wedding on Saturday. But... So I'm hoping that Dan can like take over and be really slick on the Sunday because I'm going to be hungover. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know my cousin whose wedding I'm going to. Oh, so, God, uh, yeah. I'm getting a driver to bring me over from uh, Manchester <laughs> where the, the wedding is. Dan will just fall out of the car. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be fine. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be Play Expo Blackpool if we weren't hungover doing that. Oh, of course not. Everyone expects it. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll see you there next weekend. If you want to get your tickets, of course, nip onto our website. And also the same place you can get hold of this amazing book, the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games book thanks to Bitmap Books we'll put a link in our show notes if you'd like to buy a copy of that and really help us out and right now let's get on one of the contributors to the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games as we round off Adventure Month the legendary Hal Barwood Listening to the Retro Hour podcast, where all this month we've been celebrating the art of point and click adventure games. This brilliant new book from our friends at Bitmap Books. You can get a good look at the book right now and even buy a copy and help out the show at theretrohour.com. And this is actually the last week of Adventure Month, but what an absolute star we've got joining us, one of the contributors to the book. Welcome to the Retro Hour, Hal Barwood. Oh, well, it's wonderful to join you. Uh, we're going to get some stories about you know classic games like Indiana Jones in just a moment. Uh, but actually, you've got a really interesting history because you worked in the movie industry before starting with I, games, didn't you? Yes. Uh, I, I went to film school uh, after college and um, spent 20 years in Hollywood. Wow. 
Um, so I, I was uh, an active movie guy for a long time. So I sort of split my life into two parts. Well, how did you get involved in working in Hollywood then? Well, uh, I, I grew up back east um, on the east coast of the United States. And my dad ran the local movie theater in a university town where I grew up, uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. And uh, so I was always interested in movies, and I got to see an awful lot of, of, you know, wonderful classical art films, you know, when I was a little kid, and it just stuck with me. And somewhere in the middle of um, my college career, I finally realized that I didn't really want to be a painter or an engineer. What I really wanted to do was go make movies. So um, I went off and, and uh, went to school at the uh, University of Southern California Film School, a very famous school, and where I made almost all of my adult friends. And then um, spent uh, a number of years uh, writing and uh, then eventually producing and, and in one case directing uh, movies, with, mostly with my uh, partner and still a dear friend, Matthew Robbins. Well, I even heard you had a small part in the um, Steven Spielberg movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind as well. Well, I do make us, Matthew and I make an appearance. We both got off the spaceship uh, at, in the final act. And the reason for that is, the reason why we're in it is that we did an awful lot of uh, uncredited writing on that movie. And uh, that was our reward. What, what was it like being on that set then? And when they had the huge kind of a music generating machine, did you? Uh... Oh, yes. Well, movies are a form of uh, a magic show. And nothing is as real as it, it might look when you're seeing it uh, with the, through the gauze of 35 millimeter film. And... Uh, uh, that beautiful um, visual music machine, and when they would the the guy would play the keyboard, and you would see all the lights flash it, on the set. Of course, that just looked like paper. <laughs> there were they were lights behind um, sort of uh, colored paper, so it really was cheesy. The other problem was we were down in Mobile, Alabama, in August. Um, Mobile, Alabama is in the southeast of the country, where it's very humid, and we were there was it wasn't a, uh, a stage. It was an old Air Force base that had been closed. So there were available these huge hangars, and that's where that set was built. And there were a couple of problems. One, there was absolutely no insulation. So by around noon, it was about 120 degrees inside there, and it was all you could do to stay awake. The, the, the big impulse you had standing around there was just to lie down and go to sleep. <laughs> it was just unbelievably uh, hot and, and muggy. And then around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, there would be this shattering noise that would come down because every afternoon there was a tremendous thunder shower and hail just pounding on the roof of that place. So that's really what it was like. Well, speaking of the movies that you worked on, I mean, you did the, the classic mid-'80s movie Dragon Slayer. Very well We did. Movie. We did. We shot it in your country. Mm. <laughs> what was the process like of making that movie? I mean, were you always into fantasy as a genre? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, I have been forever. And of course, um, one of the huge influences was Mr. Tolkien. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we, but we wanted to do it in a kind of a different way. We wanted to have it seem as if uh, the, the world, as we know it, actually contained dragons, that the fantasy was a real thing. And so we, we went for a very gritty kind of uh, movie. And uh, it was uh, very hard to do a movie like that. We were supposed to come in with, I think, a budget of around $10 million, and I think we spent 20 The movie was a commercial flop, uh, sad to say. It's become kind of a cult classic over the years, and I'm very proud of it. Well, I mean, talking about video games, were you a video games player at this stage? And what, did, did you visit arcades, and did you have a system at home? Or? Yes, I was. Um, Yes, of course. Now, now, they have to understand that I also was building games made out of paper and sometimes little electrical connections uh, since I was uh, early high school, I guess. And among the things I made was uh, an electrical football game where it was kind of scissors, rock, paper sort of thing where uh, each, each player had concealed switches on the side of a box. And then, um, was, you know, a defense would try to pick their defense and the offense would try to pick what kind of play they were going to do with these little setting, these little switches. And then a light would light up and say what, what had happened. And my friends went crazy over that and stole it away from me and, and played for endless hours. And, and I also did a, a few other games. I, ha I had discovered pretty early on the, the concept of paper, rock, scissors. And I thought at the time that that was a profound idea that you could... You could, you know, pit two minds against each other 
in this way that had no end of depth. And, and I still think it's profound. So that, that was an inspiration for a lot of my early game stuff. But then, yes, um, uh, it was Steve Spielberg who directed uh, Close Encounters and also directed and, and um, helped us write um, Sugarland Express, his first feature film. Anyway, he was a, a avid gamer, but in those days, of course, games were all held done in uh, arcades. And so often in the evening, we'd run off to an arcade in Westwood, you know, near in L- L.A., near UCLA, and we're, we're kind of over near where he lived. And we would go to the arcade there and play eight-way tank, which was, you know, he was very good at that, and I always got my tanks blown up. And I had, um, in addition to that, um, I have two sons, and we had a Fairchild system before we, um, before George Lucas, who's also a friend, um, uh, made the Indiana Jones movie and gave all his friends uh, Atari 2600s with a little uh, Indiana Jones cartridge. So, you know, I, I did have those home systems. Well, how did it transition from working in movies to working in video games? We were making Dragon Slayer. And in the middle of Dragon Slayer, we um, needed to have a moment um, when the dragon came through and burned down the town where everybody lived. And we were out in uh, Ivor, out in uh, the western edge of the London metro area at Pinewood. And not too far from there, there was a place called Stalker's Farm. The cool thing about Stalker's Farm was that even though you're in the middle of a metro area, you could look around about, like, say, 270 degrees, and you wouldn't see a hint of uh, buildings or, you know, any evidence of a city. And we, we, we bought, uh, rented that place as a location and built this Iron Age city with thatched roofs. And, um, we, and on the, we had to go and, and do this at night. The dragon was going to make a night attack. And we had these huge towers with these 10K lights, and our director of photography was pouring down enormous numbers of kilowatts of, of power onto this place to make moonlight. And uh, we had, um, I don't know, 100 extras, I guess, maybe more in, in burlap. And we had to make sure they didn't have uh, trainers and wristwatches on and, you know, that kind of stuff. And they had to learn uh, uh, an Iron Age dance from our choreographer. And then we had to go and reveal in a scene that we were doing in addition to the dance that one of the main characters uh, in, the, in the story who had been concealed from the lottery of involving the dragon, uh, concealed as a boy when she was actually a girl. And this is the time when she reveals to the entire town that she's a girl. And we were doing all this stuff. And my, my job as producer was to make sure that the goods and services arrive at the set with the help of Eric Rattray, my production manager. And that was a lot of hard work to get all this organized, just as a kind of like a military operation. And when it was done, I decided, I found out that I was less interested in watching my dear pal, Matthew, direct all this material than I was to go sit in my little trailer with an HP 41C calculator. And alone in there, I taught it how to play a, a Dragon Slayer version of Hunt the Wumpus. And I thought to myself, my God, you know, this is one of the great days of my life. This is this is fantastic movie production, and we're in full, full bore here, you know, with extras everywhere and this huge thing going on. And we're burning the roofs off, off these little uh, stucco houses we made. And I was not not as interested in that as I was in kind of programming and design on my own. And I realized that I was in the wrong business. If that's the way I felt about things, I was doing something wrong. So that was like an epiphany you had at that moment. Yeah, and it took me 10 years to go from that to becoming a professional uh, game designer, but I did it. Well, what was the atmosphere at LucasArts like at the time? Uh, Was there much interest in the kind of gaming division? Uh, Not at Lucasfilm, but at LucasArts, which in those days was called Lucasfilm Games when I first showed up there. It was very small. I think there may be 30 people. We were in one of the outbuildings at George's Ranch in Nevada, California, in Northern California. And, uh, you know, there just wasn't, uh, all the teams are very small. They were, the, the, the um, guys that, are, that I know best there, uh, Noah Falstein and Ron Gilbert and um, David Fox, had just finished doing um, a merchandising version of an of, 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 uh, adventure game um, from uh, The Last Crusade, the movie. And they were exhausted by the experience. It was it, building games is hard, and you do it with small teams, and the work is arduous, and it takes forever. So um, 
they didn't want to do another one and they were looking for somebody and I had been hanging around George's game company for a few years. I knew a lot of the people there because I was already building games on my own and George is a pal and so he kept me a kind of uh, apprised of what was going on. And so I got to know those guys, and they finally decided that they didn't want to do another Jones game. The, 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 the game they had built, the, the Last Crusade video game, was a big hit. And so they wanted to do another one, and they said, okay, how you do it. And so I came out of the company at that time. And uh, we just had a few people. It was kind of semi-amateurish. We had to rely on D-Paint to do all our graphics. Um, uh, Monkey Island was the first of our video games where you could have people walk in perspective. They could walk away from camera and get small. <laughs> so that was new. And uh, my game, uh, Fate of Atlantis, uh, was the first game we ever did in uh, two, as many as 256 colors. <laughs> Yeah, cause you think Monkey Island was like, what, 16 colors, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the first version was. Now, they've remastered it in later years, yeah. What was it like getting used to using the uh, Scum engine? Well, um, it was okay. I, I'm a little bit of a programmer, and I knew a little bit of uh, the language called C. And uh, Scum is a C-style language, one of many C-style languages I've learned to program over the years. And so the big problem for me was that... Uh, up until then, the games we had made were comedy, and they were also um, uh, very puzzly. They were just, just puzzly, and I thought that the spirit of Jones had to be actually adventure And so one of the things I wanted to do was do some, uh, in effect, what nowadays we'd call mini-games within the puzzly structure. And I needed to figure out a way to... to to turn um, this, you know, this art we were doing and, and using scum to create a kind of a tile style um, action adventure sort of, uh, and that was that was challenging. I had a, it was very weird. In order to be able to identify the uh, tiles, which you know, in some kind of grid, I was just using the alphabet. I would just have these strings that were like 30, 30 letters long, you know, and then and then ten letters deep or whatever it was, and. You would, you, you, Indy would take his little camel and go from, from A to, to Z and from three to five and that kind of stuff. It was tricky, but we did it and it, it worked. Well, let's talk about Indiana Jones and the fate of Atlantis. And what, what memories have you got from working on that then? How, how did you find working on that game? Well, it was um, a wonderful introduction to the professional world of game design for me. The Scum engine existed, so I could you know, basically, when you're do, running Scum, you're you're doing a scripting language, so you don't have to worry too much about the underlying operating system, which is great for people like me. I'm a kind of a lightweight programmer, and um, I, I got to work with a bunch of uh, artists who were as talented as they could possibly be, uh, with given the restrictions of deep paint, <laughs> and. Uh, so it, that was fun, and I have to say, most it was my first uh, game at Lucas Arts. Most of the people who were working with me, it was also either their first or second game, so we were all just learning as we went. And so it, it had its ups and downs. The main thing I think to think about was that I was handed a screenplay that that the that, that George didn't want to make as an actual movie of Jones, and they said that well that 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 would be something I could do as the game, and it was just terrible. There was a reason George didn't want to make it as a movie. And so um, Noah Falstein and I decided we just couldn't possibly do that. And I cooked up with him the, the, the Atlantis idea. And the studio thought that was great. So we went with that. That was, that was a big deal. And then Noah knew from his experience on Last Crusade that um, the players that would buy our games had very different tastes. Some people wanted to have fights and other people just wanted to do very simple puzzles and other people enjoyed the kind of dialogue puzzles that we were using in those days. And so Noah suggested this idea of the three paths. And, uh, and then Joe and Noah then went off to do other stuff, and I was stuck making those paths work. <laughs> and that took about 18 months, so that was, that, was, that was a big deal. That was very innovative, though, wasn't it, the three pathway system? Yeah, it was. It was. And the game was extremely popular. Um, it's still, I think, probably the biggest selling adventure game we ever did. Well, that rejected movie script that you originally got handed. I mean, what, what, do you remember much about that? Do you remember kind of what the story was? Well, I do. And I don't really want to talk about it very much because it involves people who are kind of famous. OK. And, and, uh, but I will say that it was about Africa and it was about a monkey god. 
and it was completely obscure. Nobody in America would ever be very uh, familiar with any of the mythology that was involved. And um, it was just a, a, a kind of a cheap uh, story. It didn't have any resonance. Well, how did you approach like writing a story that you know had nothing to do with the movie then? Was, was that a bit of a challenge? I'll tell you, the main challenge is that a movie script is about 100 pages long, let's say, give or take. And um, a script for a adventure game is like 500 pages long. So movies are a, an experience that is accomplished in, you know, you sit in a the theater for two hours. And when you're doing, you know, even today with uh, much shorter games, you, you're, you're going to have a long experience, many, many hours, because games are expensive. And so um, writing a story for a video game is kind of like a long Russian novel. Was there ever any ideas or talk to turn your story into a movie? People always ask that, including uh, Mr. Dyer in, in the book that we're talking about. But you have to understand that, yes, a lot of people have speculated about it. And of course, there are people busy trying to recreate you know, that fate of Atlantis. Even today, there's groups that are just redoing it all the time which I think is a terrible mistake. But you have to understand that Steve and George uh, would never make a movie out of material that had previously been published. Um, did Harrison Ford ever get involved with the games or ever have a play? No. Nowadays, we probably would do something like that. You probably would, you know, in a modern game, you would probably go and find that movie star and, and, and you, you'd, have a, you'd be able to anticipate enough revenue to be able to pay for that. But in those days... It was just an impossible idea to imagine uh, being able to pay Harrison to come and do the voice. So we found a guy who had some of the same buzzy warmth in his voice that Harrison has and um, got him to be um, uh, the Jones character. And, and we were the very first game, by the way, that, that did voice uh, and did, at, at LucasArts. Well, did you ever find out what um, – like Steven Spielberg thought of the game then. Did you ever talk to him about it? Cause like you said, he was a bit of an avid games player. Oh, yeah. Steve is a, you know, it's funny. George is not, but Steve is. And yet Steve started a game company and then uh, kind of abandoned it. And, and uh, George, although he never plays games and can, I don't think he could operate a computer. <laughs> he can do many things, but not that. And, and, um, and he stuck with it for, for forever. Um, Steve liked it. Congratulated us on it. You played it. You mentioned that it was uh, the first game to do vocals. Um, how hard was that kind of implementing the vocals and getting it to work in a well? In it a was. Fast it way? was very. It was very hard. It was kind of like the early days of movies when they when they um, had you know the sound was on a record that had to be sort of synced with the picture, which is independent, and you know you run into big sync problems. It was a little bit like that. The voice uh, was uh, audio files. And it wasn't until later games and in a redo of, I believe, of our game that we uh, made the voice digital. And you have to remember that way back then that computers didn't come with built-in sound. You had to get a sound card. And there were different kinds of sound cards with all these crazy standards. It was very weird. Yeah, so I guess you had to do like Adlib and uh, Sound Blaster in every single version. That's right. Sound, God almighty, Sound Blaster. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> The blast from the past, oh, no pun intended. That, 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 bring, that brings back memories. You know, I won't sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about the look of the game, I mean, you know, we, we did mention it was the first game to use a 256 color palette that Lucasfilms did. I mean, <laughs> did, did you work closely with the artist to kind of get that unique look of the game? I did. I did. Um, they, they, were, they were valiant and they did a great job. And, and uh, we, we, had to, we had to kind of make it, seem you know jones fictionally is is a an a, a larger than life character but he's his his adventures are set in an exaggerated version of the real world it's very different from say dragon slayer which is a, a more of a fantasy and um or star wars which is a complete fantasy and so we wanted to have a semi-realistic look but we had to push it toward um kind of a cartoon look otherwise it wouldn't look good in deep paint so finding the, finding the um, aesthetic was, was a big deal, and we worked very closely together to do that and did lots of testing and stuff. And we had three or four artists who were able to, you know, buzz through this terrible way to make art. <laughs> and uh, and I, did, I did work very closely with them. I have to understand I, I have an art background. I went to art school, and uh, I'm a graphic designer. 
Well, obviously that game did get a great reception. Um, you know, I remember reading, you know, every review I read of it was in the 90% mark at the time. What were you most proud of about the game? Oh, everything, I guess. I guess the most proud thing I am is it got done, <laughs> got out there. <laughs> you know, it's it's tough to do these things. And, and uh, usually you're doing them on a shoestring with barely enough people to get the work done. And it takes forever. And And so... I was just pr- very proud to get it done, and I was one, I was astonished by the reception. We won awards, and so that was wonderful. Um, but I'm proud of everything. Um, I think that it's uh, the main thing. I think is I'm proud of is that it's a it's actually Jonesy. When you when you play that game, you feel like you're it's authentic. Goof, it's not goofy like a lot of the other games Lucas Arts people were doing. And I think with movie licenses as well, a lot of them got it so wrong back then. I mean, you'd be a fan of a movie and then you play the game and it wasn't, you didn't get the same atmosphere or you didn't get the character, but in your game you did. I think so. Uh, well, thank you for saying so. Well, how much work was done on the Indiana Jones sequel, Iron Phoenix? Because I know development was stopped on that game, wasn't it? Yes. I wasn't really involved, um, except that I came up with a sort of a fatal idea. And I'm not, I guess Iron Phoenix. There, there were several Jones games that were started and then abandoned, and, and and other ones that, of course, eventually did get made, like Emperor's Tomb, that I wasn't involved with. But in the case of Iron Phoenix, I believe this is the one, um, there was also the Spear of Destiny in there somewhere. And the idea was that we were going to uh, do another one that was slightly post-World War II. But um, there was a desire to bring the Nazis back in, and I, I thought that was getting rather old, but there was a clever way we could do it, which is we could imagine that <clears throat> some of the Nazis who had fled Germany after the war were busy down in South America uh, trying to um, conjure up a new version of Hitler, and uh, Jones would get involved and stop that. Um, so there was a mystical side of it, this kind of idea of resurrecting this guy. And, and so forth. And everybody got excited about it. And then we found out that in Germany, we could not be able to sell a single unit. And Germany was a huge market for us. So that, that was the end. Well, moving on from that, I mean, did you kind of feel like the, the adventure genre started to fade away around that time? I did. Now, I have to understand that these days, my wife and I play adventure games like almost every evening. And one after another, we played dozens of these things. And so they've made a kind of a comeback in a, in a funny sort of way. It's casual games. But I did feel, uh, even in the middle of it all, I, my, my taste in games, if, I have a website and I have some of my old stuff that I did before I went to LucasArts, you know, on that website. And um, anyway, um, my, my actual taste is more toward action-adventure kind of games where, um, you know, you have a character and there are puzzles and so forth, but you're also fighting monsters and fighting other bad guys and so on and so forth. And um, I started to also feel that the, that the game world was getting away from LucasArts a little bit. We, we didn't quite advance in terms of our graphic capabilities and so forth as fast as I thought we should. And so I, I kind of got sour on the adventure game idea, and I wanted to do other things. And so I, I eventually did do that. And I've only come back and kind of toward adventure games you know, late in life. I think then as well, I mean, around that time, technology was advancing so quickly, wasn't it? And it seemed like things were developing at such a rate that the, the teams that you'd have to have to work on games and the size of them was growing exponentially every year. Oh, I think that Fate of Atlantis, I guess I had a dozen people. And then on Jones and the Infernal Machine, uh, which was an action-adventure game um, in 3D, <laughs> 3D in 1999, and um, we had uh, 35 or 40 people working on that. And then the last game I did at Lucas, which unfortunately wasn't a commercial success, um, uh, Red Rock, um, we had, I, I guess, 85 people working on that game. And now people have, you know, it, 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 it's in the hundreds. Well, talking about Infernal Machine, I mean, uh, what was the, the idea of taking that into 3D then? Because I imagine everything was 3D in the industry at that time. But what was it like working on that game and how did the concept and ideas develop? Well... I wanted to, I wanted to get back uh, the franchise that was stolen from us, <laughs> Tomb Raider, and so I proposed doing a, a Jones uh, game, which would be a semi-puzzly platformer action game, and so the the company thought it would be a great idea, and we did it. But we, 
um, we had ha- we did have a 3D engine. It was first person. It was from a game called Dark Forces, which was a big hit for us, Star Wars game. But it was a first person shooter, and I wanted to do something which is third person. So you you know if you don't see Jones, it doesn't feel like Jones. So you know you have to have a a, a third person point of view, and getting that engine to do that was a, a big task. It took a long time, and. Um, uh, one of the things I admired about the Tomb Raider games was how quickly they could whip those levels out. Well, they did it because they had a kind of a voxel system. They, their, their level design system was based on one meter cubes. And they would pile these up with different textures all over the place to create those worlds. And in those days, when 3D was just getting going, um, that, that kind of look worked. But we didn't have a, a system like that. We had a the, the, the rocky beginnings of what people do now with 3D. And so we had to construct everything with geometry and a bunch of textures, and it turned out to be laborious and took forever. Originally, I wanted to do um, a, a version of, the, of, of what Joe's would encounter. You know, this, it, it, we were talking about doing this in the early post-war period, just after World War II. I wanted to get rid of the Nazis. I thought that was getting pretty old. And uh, I had done and, – and, um, so I thought, well, you know, about 1947 or so is when flying saucers got to be interesting. People went crazy over them. And I thought, well, we'll have Jones do that. And I, uh, we, we had to go to Lucasfilm itself and find out if we could do such a story. And we were told, don't go there. And it turned out that they were eventually going to do the, the, the fourth Jones movie, uh, The Crystal Skull, involving uh, aliens. So I had to think of something else. And I, I, the thing about Jones is that, you, you, you know, it's all fictional, but you need some kind of touchstone to reality. And in this case, I decided that the Tower of Babel and, uh, would be the touchstone. What do you think of the Indiana Jones um, revival and the, the new movie? Oh, I hated it. <laughs> Don't tell George. <laughs> well, he also worked oh, on... No. Um, Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 as well. I mean, that was a massive franchise to, to work on. Oh, God. Do you remember that brief moment in history when there was such a thing as multimedia? Yeah. <laughs> CD-ROMs and everything, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> we, we needed to do video for this um, wonderful shooter, which uh, Vince Lee had cooked up. Vince, um, wonderful guy, one of my colleagues at, at uh, Lucasfilm, at LucasArts, um, on his own, built a, a video a, a codec. And uh, before, there was, those things were just common. And so he used it to do Rebel Assault, and they wanted to do another one, and they wanted to actually do a video. And so they, they knew that I was, had directed and, and so on. And so I directed the live-action stuff on a little set down in San Rafael. It was fun. Because I remember the first time I saw those sequences on it, and... Uh... It was pretty stunning compared to the stuff that I'd been playing before. Well, you know, nowadays um, you go to the arcades, which still exist, and you play games like Rebel Assault all the time. You know, there's a Jurassic Park one out right now where you just all the dinosaurs are coming at you and you shoot them. And, uh, but Area 51, I guess, is the, the arcade version of this that became very famous. And, of course, I have my own little gun and my, my old uh, uh, PS2 and I can play uh, Area 51 whenever I want to. Yes, I remember Area 51. That was a great title. I mean, imagine with the budget you were given for the game. I mean, you, you essentially had to kind of direct a Star Wars movie with, um, <laughs> like, like, what, a tenth of the budget or something? We did. We, I think we shot for, f- for five days and on a complete shoestring. And it was really interesting because we had to conform the 3D to the the the, the actual art backgrounds you know there, you know there was no plate so we had to do that how are we going to do it the, the way ilm would do it for example when they were making jurassic park was on the on the set or in in the in the actual shooting they put tennis balls in there's a big sequence it's very famous when um uh sam neill and the kids are running from this group of dinosaurs that are just you know stampeding and they run, they run along the grass and the camera's moving all over the place and these dinosaurs just go rushing past and they hide behind a log as they bounce over it. And you wonder, how did they conform the, the perspectives of the actual real footage with Sam, Neil, and the kids with the dinosaurs, which are all created at ILM? And they, they, they didn't do it by uh, fixing the camera or anything like that, which we had to do back in Close Encounters days. 
what they did was they just placed tennis balls that were you could be seen by the camera and in, in, in the on the in, on that grassy area, and then they were able to compute the perspective from how the tennis balls looked at any given instant. So that was pretty cool. But we couldn't do that. So what we did is we had video feed and I would just move the camera around with a, with a shot. We could do a duplicate where we could show the, the art that, that, the, that was the, formed most of, this, of the set. And I had these little guys in their stormtrooper uniforms running around somewhere and I had to get the perspective right. And we would just move the camera and change the zoom until on um, – on our video monitor, I would just look at them walking around and the perspective would be correct. And then we'd say, OK, we shoot it like that. And that's how we did that stuff. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we're so we, we spent about five days on the set. And this is a funny little place with, you know, with a, with a blue screen lit up as bright as we could do it. You know, and we were able to extract all the images pretty easily. And in the middle of our shoot, our CEO quit. <laughs> so, <Wow. laughs> It was it was an adventure. When you actually saw the game finished, and you know, I imagine it was pretty heavily compressed with those codecs you had to, you had to use back then. It was. It was. In the, it was just in the same way that that three D looked terrible in those days. I mean, looking back, for 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 many years, I couldn't even look at Infernal Machine because it just looked so clunky. But now I love it, and and I can play it on good old games and and uh, on my Windows Ten machine, and I love it because it just looks retro. We've, we've come so far that, that all that stuff just looks retro. So uh, for a long time, I thought Rebel Assault was kind of crummy. But, you know, now I just think, wow, it's great looking. Yeah, it's got a bit of a charm about it looking back, hasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Well, you also created the Yoda stories as well, which was like a, a desktop adventure game. Um, what was the inspiration for that? Well, that's really um, – that's a big story because that's a, that's a casual game before there were such things. Mm. And, and I knew I was inventing the idea, but the rest of the company didn't. And it was very hard for me to, to kind of get that to go. And it's uh, um, I love that game because one of the things that bothered me, and it still bothers me to some degree, is that most games, because they cost a lot of money, have to be long. And I come from a, a, a world where you can have a major entertainment in much less time. And I have almost never played a game that that I didn't make <laughs> that I thought the story went as went as far as the game did you know usually the story peters out about halfway through the experience and you're just slogging some kind of horrible dungeon crawl or whatever and I find that stuff very boring and I, I thought you know what I really want is I want to have a quick experience I don't want to be too far divorced from the rest of the world that I'm in and that I enjoy and I, but I want to dive into a fictional experience and have some fun for a while and then stop and then go back and do it again. And I figured out a way to uh, write puzzles that are um, uh, created procedurally in the, in the game and that we could vary the experience within certain parameters uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty thoroughly from game to game. So you can play these short games and um, – uh, and go back and play them again. And even the same, we have like each, Yoda Stories has 15 different scenarios, but each time you play the, each scenario, it'll be different. And it won't be different in the sense that you, you on one, at one time you're in the, in the green fields of Africa and the next time you're on some planet, it won't be like that, but it'll be different the way a chess game is different each time. You know, within certain limits, there, there, there is a tremendous variety. And I got very interested in that and I sat down and I did a prototype in about a month, I guess, because w- w- the studio was very doubtful. Uh, in um, God Almighty, it was Apple HyperTalk back in the HyperCard days. And I did the whole prototype that way. And then they said, okay, we'll do it, but we need to have a, a franchise. And so it wound up being first the Jones version and then um, Yoda Stories. I still love Yoda Stories. And I got to get fan mail from people who have played it 5,000 times. Well, that's the thing. Most adventure games, you play them through once and that's it. You, you know the story you've done. You, you wouldn't ever want to replay them. Right. Right. Well, why did you eventually leave LucasArts? Well, they didn't want me around anymore and I didn't want to be around anymore. I, 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 you know, in Sam's book, there's a little bit of a discussion of this sort of thing. LucasArts, I don't want to be too harsh because I love the people that I worked with while I was there. And I um, had good relations with most of the people that I dealt with. But it was a company that was 
slowly going downhill. And um, I was, you know, that, that old story about uh, if you drop a frog into boiling water, he hops back out and everything's fine. But if you put him in water and slowly heat it, it, it gets him. Well, that was me. Uh, it, it, over a slow, uh, long period of time, LucasArts was just kind of going to hell. And um, we got in trouble in lots of different ways. And I became very dissatisfied with how things were going. I worked for... Uh, in, the, in the 13 years I was there, I worked for 10 different people. We, uh, the, the average tenure of someone who ran the company was about a year. So 1.3 years, I guess. That was terrible. And a lot of people came in. George was not very interested in hiring people who were uh, talented and with experience. And instead, we hired an awful lot of people who just had – it was their first job. And not all those people were people who really ought to be in the game business. And uh, it, it, it resulted in a, in a complete change in the, in the taste of the, of the company and, um, you know, what kind, of, what kind of projects people wanted to do and what kinds of stories they wanted to tell and what kind of interactivity they wanted. And I found it very... Um, so when you left LucasArts, did you just walk, walk away from the gaming industry? Was that kind of, you didn't want to do it? No, anymore? no, no, I didn't. Um, I uh, freelanced. Mm -hmm. uh, I did for about, for another, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years, I, I did a lot of freelance work, um, design and a little bit of um, uh, you know, level design and, and, and story stuff. But there is a problem. Um, uh, I used to live in Marin County, California, just north of the Golden Gate uh, Bridge. And um, that's a hotbed of, of, of game companies. There are lots of them in Marin and all over the Bay Area in general. Um, and uh, there are big uh, bubbles of, of game development in Vancouver, British Columbia. There is an awful lot of gaming going on in Seattle, Washington, and also Los Angeles and even in San Diego. But not in Portland, where I moved. My my children gave up the California dream and moved to Port, uh, Oregon, and so eventually when my wife retired, we, we followed them. And uh, I soon learned there was a little bit of a drawback. Uh, there just really isn't any game development going on here. There is some small indie companies, so some stuff happens, but not a lot. And I found that it wasn't enough to be able to use Skype and have a lot of PDFs to be able to stay uh, viable in the game business. And so I turned to my um, another passion of mine, a deep one, and I just started writing books. I'm just finishing my sixth novel, and uh, so that's what I do these days. Do you still keep an eye on the video games industry, though, and do you think he'll, oh, he'll of get involved? Oh, of in course, game? yeah. Would you like to do more games? You know, I I would, but I guess it'll just be small games that I can do on my own. Um, I have a couple of ideas that I would love to turn into games, but I find that writing a novel takes all my time. Well, you mentioned that you've been playing some uh, point-and-click adventures. Have you had a chance oh to play uh, Fimbleweed Park yet? I, I, I played it through, yes, of course. Ron is a dear friend, and, and I, I had to play it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, was, uh, it took me back. It's, it's interesting. Um, I play an awful lot of these things, and... Um, they're almost all made in Poland. They're, the, the emphasis is on very beautiful two-dimensional art and uh, very simple puzzles and then some inventive mini-games. And I enjoy them. And they're wonderful. And I think as well what you said before about the, that kind of retro-style art now being... It's kind of acceptable again. I think that probably helps a lot because you don't need million-pound studios behind you or million-dollar studios. I, that, that's true for Thimbleweed Park, but if you look at the stuff that Artifacts Monday does, um, uh, the, their stuff is, uh, you know, very, very uh, um, elaborate art. It's the, the main thing they do is beautiful art. I don't know how they contract it out, but they do, and they have various studios that develop for them, and we've played stuff from all half a dozen different studios. But the, the emphasis seems to be, a, a friend of mine um, said that, well, modern adventure games are just interactive stories with speed bumps. And, and that's kind of true. Mm. They're, very, they're pretty simple, and you can play them much more quickly than... I mean, Thimbleweed Park is a, is a, is a real head-scratcher game, and, and, you know, in the classic sense. I mean, it's a real seriously inventive puzzle game. And I was I congratulated myself when I finally got to the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but the other the games that I play, uh, you know, most of the time are these point and clicks that from Eastern Europe, and you know, with English you know, uh, voice and so forth, and they're they're just wonderful, but they're by comparison very simple to play. I think even even the classic games, you kind of forget just how big those games were as well. I mean, the other day on on our stream, I was playing the special edition of The Secret of Monkey Island. And I oh tended God, to play yeah. for like an hour um, just to do the three trials, but it took me about two and a half hours. By the time I'd done them, it was like a lot longer than I remembered. Yeah, that's 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 the case. That it, it, and in in in, um, in America, the only adventure game that I've played in recent years, aside from Thimbleweed, and I really love this game. It's called Firewatch. So if you haven't played it, I recommend it. It's just an absolutely wonderful game. Do you think we'll get um, like modern HD versions of the Indiana Jones games that you worked on? Well, I would love it if someone did that, but um, I think that instead, it's uh, Disney has put it up on good old games. Hmm. Well, my old games are there, and they are what they are. It's good that anyone can play them on there now, though. You don't need all the old systems anymore. Well, I, um, you know, like anybody who's interested in technology, I keep upgrading all my electronic equipment. And I discovered to my horror that Windows 10, unless you get the, uh, the, the uppermost version, which will do some uh, legacy software for corporations who've got old stuff, um, I couldn't uh, get Indiana Jones, the Infernal Machine, to play. So I um, kept an old Windows 7 machine that I've got, and it just sits there. And the only purpose in life it has is to be able to play Infernal Machine, just in case I ever wanted to do it again. But now I'm, you know, I'm a member of, of great, good old games, and I can just play it. It works great. They figured out how to make it work on Windows 10 with no problems whatsoever. Yeah, someone will always figure out a way, won't they? And well, that's good. I, I, I think that's wonderful. Emulators are the way in which we are going to preserve the legacy of the early years of this business. Yeah, and it is like one of the, well, the biggest entertainment industry in the world now, video games, isn't it? It is. Yeah. You know, um, I, my movie friends, most of them are my age. And, you know, I'm in my late 70s. And, uh, you know, I didn't become a professional game designer until I was 50 years old. And um, anyway, um, so all my movie friends have no idea that I had this career in video games. They don't even know what a video game is, really. <laughs> and it's a big shock to them when suddenly in, the, in a double uh, truck spread in variety, it will, it will tell you that, that, that Call of Duty made $500 million on its first day, which is beyond anything a movie has ever done. Yeah, jaw dropping. Yeah, it is. So, and unfortunately, um, the problem is, of course, that every every generation of uh, video games that starts to develop uh, is more demanding of resources, and it puts a lot of smaller studios out of business. They, they just fail left and right every time there's uh, an escalation of the stakes. So you have now. Um, Big hits like Call of Duty, of course, and and uh, Fortnite, my God, mm. and um, and and on the other hand, you have small indies and almost nothing in between. It's a, a desert in between. Well, over the last few weeks in our show, we've been talking about this uh, book, The Art of Point and Click Adventure Games, which um, you do actually feature in the book. Which it's a real love letter to that genre, really, oh, it, isn't it? It is. It's a gorgeous book. I'm so I'm so pleased to be uh, part of it. Well, what do you think um, makes adventure games such a beloved genre? I think the I think partly because the emphasis is on narrative, and um, they're comfortable, and um, I, I think that uh, you, you feel cozy when you're playing an adventure game. You you feel like you're you're you're, you're you dive into that world in a way that is comfortable. And long may it continue. Yes, please. Well, Hal, it's been a pleasure having you on this week. Thank you so much for your time. I'm very happy to join you. And uh, if people do want to read more about your uh, stories, it will be in the book, The Art of Point and Click Adventure Games. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I would like to mention, if you want to know all about me, please go to my website, which is www.finitearts.com. And I'll put that in this week's show notes as well so people can click through. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Hal. Okay, bye-bye now. And thank you for checking out this week's episode of the Retro Hour podcast where we have reached the end of Adventure Month with the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games book from Bitmap Books. Please do get a look at it and you can buy it for the next week and really help out the podcast on our website at theretrohour.com and we'll see you next Friday.